higher education sector attracts many students now eager to learn, create and prosper through increasingly familiar technology. Degree offerings have expanded in response to such digital demand. For example, in 2007, the UK's University and Colleges Admission Services indicates that some 298 music technology specialisations alone now exist across Britain's colleges and universities. In Australia, Edith Cowan's WAPA, Griffith University, QUT, RMIT, Victorian College of the Arts and others continue to attract and graduate significant numbers of artists and according to DEST statistics, growing steadily at the rate of 2% a year, as opposed to IT enrolments. Interesting figures. Meanwhile, from MySpace to YouTube, Flickr and Last.fm, an online participatory culture is transforming value systems and creating new pathways for autonomous innovation. In the so-called Web2 phenomenon, social networks continue to define the information society and in turn redefined artistic career opportunities quite different to traditional training preconceptions of a former era. Yet in music, although the romanticised 70s style star driven model of the record, record company, the artist, the multi-million dollar studio is no longer widespread, the classroom reveals that many students maintain outmoded ideas of just what professional musicians do and how they make a living. Inexperience together with the folklore of the trade magazines and mass media hyperbole continues to assert this. Similarly, faculty, staff and administrators may remain decades out of touch with contemporary, perhaps puzzling, viral practices, as recently argued by MIT researchers. In our adult lives, we're depending more on others to provide information we cannot process ourselves. Our schools are not teaching what it means to live and work in such knowledge communities, but popular culture may be doing so. University-based creative arts faculties may rightly argue to be places of higher learning, art for art's sake, not necessarily connected to commercial outcomes, but rather to promote higher order thinking, creativity and excellence in craft. Still, neither can music educators afford to ignore the fact that many students desire vocational success and to be able to work rewardingly as professional artists. Responsive training does not necessarily mean a shift away from core skills. It does, however, speak directly to the imperative to acknowledge authentic context for artistic and intellectual craft. Graduate success will continue to demand high caliber artistry, but also fluid abilities and the technological imagination with which to respond to transformed next generation 2.0 opportunities. This Wednesday's keynote is by Sue Baker from uh, the Victorian College of the Arts. She examines the idea of art schools as a new cultural economy in the information age. In this, Sue asks the questions, what is the infrastructure for such a place and what tools, pedagogy and organisational systems do we set up to support it? And how do we shift from the model of teaching a pre-existing body of knowledge to facilitating the discovery of knowledge not yet formed? So here I, I wish to attempt a partial response to Sue's question by turning to a recent experiment led by the Queensland Conservatorium Research Centre and its partners during the June to August of 2007. This year was the 50th anniversary of the Queensland Conservatorium with celebrations and feature performances being undertaken throughout 2007. One central theme that was pursued was that of an operatic celebration of Orpheus, the mythical Greek musician. In all, there were four featured events around this theme. In June, often Bach's parody of the legend of Orpheus in the Underworld was performed in the Conservatorium Theatre. In July, and on the occasion of its 400th anniversary, Monteverdi's original version of La Feo was performed in the Masonic Temple in Brisbane as part of the Queensland Music Festival. And in September, the Con's major theatre production for 2007 was Gluck's famous opera, Orfeo et Eurydice. In other words, a pre-existing body of knowledge preserved and recast to new audiences as befitting a world-class conservatoire celebrating an important birthday. But the shift in modelling such a work to facilitate a deeper understanding of the Orpheus legend came in the form of a fourth project entitled I Orpheus, Art Among, Among Us, an experimental work, a new kind of opera spanning time and spaces using contemporary technology, opening the famous mythical themes to interpretation, echo, improvisation, and led by US internet music pioneers William Duckworth and Nora Farrell. Let me give you a bit of background on them. 
Nora Farrell is a software engineer specialising in programming web applications for the publishing and music industries. Uh, mediated communication and community are central to Nora's creative work where she draws on RSS and data feeds, virtual instruments, social networks and open source to build a sound palette, mixing multiple streams live in connected performance. She designs custom applications and virtual instruments including a multi-user pitch web that allows people to play together online in real time and the mobile pitch web recently premiered in Tokyo in March 2007. William Duckworth is a professor of music at Bucknell University, a composer, performer and author whose work is known worldwide. In 1997, Bill and Nora began The Cathedral Project, the first interactive work of music and art on the web. Visitors to the cathedral site now total over four million. And its development is chronicled in Bill's book, Virtual Music, How the Web Got Wired for Sound. His recent honours include the 2001 ASCAP Themes Taylor Internet Award, the 2002 Award in Music from the Foundation for Contemporary Arts, and a Senior Fulbright Specialist Award for the iOrpheus Project, known locally as the iPod Opera. This was a public opera based on the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. From June through August, Bill and Nora worked with conservatorium staff, technicians, students, and general public to come to a different understanding of the art, to inject their interpretations and improvisations into a new kind of fluid and open opera. Performed on iPods, mobile phones and laptops, along with interactive installations and live performers, iOffice took place on Friday, August 31st, 2007, across a range of sites throughout Brisbane, South Bank, Parklands. The project was documented by a group of film school students and led by MA Honours candidate, film producer and director, Paul Davidson. It now gives me great pleasure to present this first public screening of iOffice the movie. The traditional story of Orpheus comes from Ovid's Metamorphosis, and basically what happened was that Orpheus, who was, was the most famous musician uh, who ever lived, uh, gets married to Eurydice, uh, but Eurydice the next morning is bitten by a snake and dies. So Orpheus goes to the underworld to try to get her back. And of course, living people can't cross the river Styx and go into the land of the dead, but he's able to charm the boatman through his, his singing and moves into the land of the dead and from there talks to the gods and convinces them to uh, let him bring her back. But he's been warned not to turn around and look at her until he gets back to the land of the living. Uh, he begins to have doubts and he can't help himself and he turns and looks back and loses her forever. We're calling this an iPod opera, and we tend to take the word opera in its most literal sense, which is a large-scale work with lots of visuals, lots of musicians, lots of movement, lots of dancers. Now, we're not telling the story in any kind of a literal way. What we are doing is to create memories and echoes of the story that will resonate with people with their own memories uh, that they bring to the experience. And we feel the need that, in addition to having musicians, we really do need to have actors and dancers. and. Uh, create more of a spectacle to surround uh, the sound. When I learned that they were in fact projecting a project around Orpheus, my antennae went up immediately and I said, well, we must get this to Australia. I think it's an amazing opportunity. Um, the scale of it is completely incomprehensible at the moment and I, I think it will remain that until we're actually in performance. But just the chance it gives all of us students and staff to get involved in a really big project and bring lots of different people together well, we've never done that before at the Conservatorium, so it's really exciting. Pretty excited about iOrpheus because it's a an event that engages the public space of South Bank. Uh, for a long time, we've been, I guess, conscious of the fact that we have a number of cultural um, institutions within South Bank, and part of our objective, or particularly as part of our cultural development policy, uh, if you like, is to take the creative energy that's within those institutions out into the parkland. I'm really quite excited about tomorrow. Always the week before for a big event, particularly an event where you don't know what's, what's going to be happening. Um, there's a little bit of anxiety uh, or nervousness about things, but things seem to be coming together quite, quite wonderfully. So all in all, iOrpheus 
is about space and about scale and about memory and about air. They say that we are wedding today. He's a musician. His name is Orpheus. Her, Eurydice. Watch out. Things happen at weddings that are unpredictable. Two minutes. Two minutes to kick off. Two minutes to kick off. <laughs> One of the things we're echoing is the idea that the South Bank Parklands was originally the Expo 88 site. Another sound installation that we have is by Warren Burt from Wollongong, and Warren was actually at the original Expo 88 site, and he's using some of the sounds that he, he created for uh, Expo 88 in the sound installation that he's doing at the Nepalese Pagoda for us. What we're really doing with this story is echoing much of the original material, not only uh, verbal material, but sound material as well. Daniel Blinkhorn's sound installation is titled, And They Threw His Singing Head Into the Sea, which is the point in the story where Orpheus uh, charms the boatman and crosses the river Styx. Shades and shadows passing, uncontrollable, the din horrendous. Somewhere here, you have to find her. It's not clear how you would. It's not clear at all. What's happening? The sense of space expanding and collapsing. Sense of rushing madness. Sense of shrieking and horror. Sense of anything. who'll be in the water themselves. This is very highly dramatic. So we just noticed some aspects of the landscape that also lend themselves to movement of the musicians. So we're building the drama, getting ready to go to the look, to the big moment, where is he gonna make it or lose her? Those who were left were waiting. The law was he could have her back and she would follow him into the light, but he couldn't turn around. 
still the love they had had burned like the flames down there. The directors of artistic directors of our Orpheus Life, William Duckworth and Nora Farrell. Here we are. Hi, great to see you. Can you hear? Great to see you. Fabulous. We've just enjoyed the movie. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, Bill, can you tell us a little bit more about your thinking about the music, internet culture, what you led you to this point of the project? Sure, I'll be glad to. Uh, and first, let me say it's nice to see you again. It would be nice to be back in Brisbane. We had a wonderful time. And thanks to Paul uh, Davidson for such a wonderful documentary. Uh, Nora and I have been working online for about 10 years. Uh, we're really happy that Music 2.0 is coming along because we spent the past decade working in Music 1.0. Our web uh, project Cathedral went online in June of 1997. It was the first interactive work of music and art online. It consisted of a website, new virtual instruments that we created, and a live band that played uh, both in concert and online. Uh, our first five years of development culminated in 2001 in a 48-hour uh, webcast that streamed 34 concerts live from five continents. Uh, between 2001 and 2005, we established the presence of the Cathedral Band, both live and online, uh, and uh, married it to the online pitch web band that we had created. And we gave concerts around the world, including some in Australia in 2002, uh, in Japan in 2003, and in various places in New York in 2004 and 2005, including the Cutting Room uh, and the Winter Garden. And then for the past two years, 2006 and 2007, we've been working on an Orpheus trilogy. And what you just saw was the third part of that trilogy. It began in April of 2006 as an iPod opera that was podcast in 26 episodes ending in February of 2007. We ended the project live and on stage in Phoenix, Arizona in February of 2007 and then into the streets of uh, South Bank, South precinct Brisbane in August of uh, this year, 2007. In all of this work online, one of the things we found out is that people are willing to organize themselves into community. Look at Flickr, look at Facebook, and for creative artists, what that gives us is the ability then to blur the distinction between the amateur and the professional. And it allows for elements of chance, uh, because the collective contributions of uh, 
people online uh, always have uncertain outcomes. So when we, Nora and I look at the future, what we're seeing is an entirely new landscape made possible by Music 2.0 that involves availability, uh, portability, collectivity, and communications. And we can talk a little bit about that later if you'd like to. Lovely. Thanks, Bill. We will. Um, Nora. Uh, Where's your technology imagination going to take you? What do you think the future holds? What do you think comes up next? Uh, well, our, our future is clearly orienting towards object-oriented authoring. That's where the future is taking us. For the next 18 months, we'll be offering um, courseware for three music titles, as Bill is a highly regarded textbook author as well. The U.S. publishing industry is currently undergoing a tremendous change that seems to me to be redefining the concept of the book as we know it. The emphasis is on providing a customized learning experience with print and digital material closely integrated as courseware, rather than the old model of media supplemental to the print material. So the 10th edition of this book on music fundamentals will be the lead music title in Thompson's Engage's new Learning Lot portal which is a database-driven content management system which employs all of the features that we've come to identify as Web 2.0, video, audio, blogs, RSS feeds, to extend and enhance the print material. Plus, we'll be providing a skills assessment piece for the students that generates a custom set of practice exercises finely tuned to their individual level and their need. Bill and I are also co-editors of the new music appreciation title for Prentice Hall. Called Music I Appreciation, it's organized around the core theme of the click wheel, and learning is reinforced by leading students to create and publish their own custom playlist that traverses music through time and genre. I built a wiki, which we're using to author the print version and the website simultaneously. Each of our eight contributing authors posts the material and editing and annotation is ongoing. This authoring model is first for Prentice Hall, and we're finding a really efficient way to build and organize the material. And creatively, we're throwing ourselves into the mobile phone. Bill and I feel very strongly that this is the future of computing, or at the very least, the place where we want to focus our energies as creative artists. And the present state of mobile software development feels very similar to where the web was in 1996. And it isn't that hard to imagine where it could take us. And if we're right, I hope you'll invite us back in a few years to talk all about Phone 2.0. Lovely, for sure. <laughs> Listen, please stay with us. I hope the internet connection doesn't drop out. You said you, that you were excited about um, some future direction in web technologies. I was talking more about getting very excited about mobile software. Okay. Developing okay. applications for the mobile telephone. Um, we have, uh, you've read in the, in the bios, we've got our own virtual instrument called the Pitch Web, which we recently debuted in Tokyo. We'll be adding a second level of interactivity to that and, and debuting that in Seattle in October. And so I think that'll bring us closer to our concept of um, integrated mobile telephones that also exchange on a one-to-one -one basis. Okay, how do you feel about um, compression algorithms and the reduction in audio quality and the move, movement away? Well, the movement into MP3 is a reduction in audio quality. Do you think that in the future that we might see a uh, resurgence or a move back towards audio quality, maybe if, if we can get different compression algorithms that can actually handle that? I don't think that either one is mutually exclusive of the other. If you look at iTunes itself, for example, you can order the um, lower bandwidth version because it's a smaller file, or you can go ahead and buy the audio file version. I think what's very important for us as artists and educators is to make sure that our audience gets to hear both. Because if you have students coming up who have never heard a 96K feed in surround sound or 7.1, they have nothing to compare the sound to. 
So I think as, as long as we maintain exposure of all types of, of formats and sampling frequencies, we'll be able to really run the spectrum of preserving proper audio quality. Held, held down the back. Held shippers. Hi, Bill and Nora. Um, seeing the Iorpheus movie uh, online now, uh, to me, feels like a kind of coming full circle of, 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 of a web-based concept that turned into live um, on the 31st of August of this year and now returned to, to the web. And having been part of, part of that, uh, that genesis, c could you reflect on how you see the two and a half hour event condensed back to 10 minutes of, uh, of YouTube video? Well, I'm not sure we actually look at it that way. Um, it, I don't see, I, I see it more the way Paul sees it, which is as a, a, a new invention using the same basic material. Uh, Paul has been calling it I Orpheus the movie, and we've been calling it I Orpheus the iPod Opera, and I think those things, two things intersect but I don't think that they're exactly the same thing. I believe I agree with Paul Davidson about that. That makes eminent sense. Thank you. Thank you. We're just about out of time. Thank you very much for spending um, your Sunday night with us. I think it's about a little after midnight, isn't it? Just about, yeah. <laughs> uh, and thanks very much to Paul Davidson. Um, uh, it was very enjoyable to work with all of you on the project. Thanks very much. And we'll hang up for now, and I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you on the email soon. Wonderful. All right. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. bye, -bye.